Okay. Okay. Good morning, everyone. We are in Perak Lamed Aleph, Chapter Thirty One of Sefer Yeshayahu, and it's good to have everyone back. I'm glad that everyone was able to take that week off. It worked out very well. Uh, I'm just going to move my background for a moment. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. The this parak is the source of many times in Sefer Yeshayahu because of the lack of some some information, a source of a bit of debate. And that is what is the subject precisely of the parak? We do know that the subject Bagadol in the big picture is uh, talking about the Jews making an alliance with a foreign power. We know the foreign power which the Jews have made alliances with in Jewish history was Mitzrayim with Egypt. And they did it against Assyria. So those kind of pieces fit, but they did it at two different times in Jewish history. Once they did it earlier in the time of Hoshea ben Ela was the king of the north towards the end of the northern kingdom. And the second time that occurred was this uh, alliance that was attempted to be made with in the time of Chizkiyahu. Um, because in both cases, the Assyrians threatened the Jews, once in the northern kingdom and once in the southern kingdom. And so based on that, the Meforshim take a little bit of different turns on how they ex precisely explain it. Rashi takes this parak as referring to the northern tribes. However, Shadal, or Schwab, others all talk about being about the southern kingdom. And if it is, whether, the, whether it is the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom, it's a continuation mm -hmm of what we had had at the beginning of the previous parak, because at the beginning of the previous parak, we'd also talked about the danger of creating alliances that was in Perik Lamed, Sukim Aleph through Zion. So now in Lamed Aleph, we start out with our famous Hoy. Now, Hoy, again, as we mentioned before, with Ibn Ezra says, many other Mephoshim say, is analogous to Oi, the same kind of thing. It's the same kind of sound. It's a sound that, oh my God, what's going to happen? And in this kind of case, hoy hayordim mitzrayim Ezra. Woe unto those who are going down to Egypt to seek the help. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the Ibn Ezra says, these people who are going down at this time of challenge, going down to Egypt, are actually going to die in Egypt, will never see the salvation itself. They're going to rely on the horses of Egypt. Egypt was very famous for the horses. It was something we talk about in the Chumash. Don't go back to Mitzrayim for their, their horses as well. They were known as horses in the ancient world was like a superpower kind of military um, force. Don't go, They're relying on those horses. And on the other hand, they also go ahead, and they're also relying on the various forms, on the chariots and kiravu, because there's many of them, and on the riders, because they're very, very powerful. So we, we really bemoan, the Navi bemoans the, the choice people are making. You're choosing to make an alliance with a power that has this great a military force, but ultimately, this great military force is not going to help you. And they don't turn, that's according to the Mitzudat Zion, according to the Radak, they don't have faith in the Kedosh Yisrael, in the sacred one of Israel. And they're not seeking God. Now, one, one second. If you notice, there are two different ways we talk about God here. The Kedosh Yisrael. And we also talk about God directly as God. The reason why, and this is the Dat Mikra suggests this, the reason why it talks about Kadosh Yisrael in this way is because it's in distinction to the Susim, the Rechem, and the Parashim. It's in distinction to what those physical manifestations, what they're trying to seek help in, as opposed to helping in the spiritual God, the holiness of God. And then, and they're not davening. They're not trying to, so, to find that salvation. Or, according to the Dat Sofrim, they're not seeking the prophet to give them the advice of what should be taking place. Questions? Yeah. Well, they're looking at this from a current uh, perspective. Israel doing the same thing as the United States. Uh, we have... And, and also, we did it wrong before. So, I, in terms of current, I'm not sure... 
that I would be willing to make that same statement about current because there's a lot of davening and there's a lot of other mitzvot that are being done at the same time. It's not that we're in current times. It's not an either or. Anytime you enter into a war, it is also wrong for the Jewish people just to sit in daven and not do anything about it. So there's a balance. And the question really is the balance. Rabbi Willig addressed that a little bit yesterday in the question and answer session here, where he was talking about uh, how we approach those people who uh, are not, you know, who are not really coming out in favor of Tzahal and, and seem to say, you know, don't protest in Washington. Don't do this. Don't do this. We should be sitting and davening and learning. He said, it's a valid approach. But our approach is that we need the, this balance of the two. And we need to have that balance. And we're not sure that those people who are saying, Davin, and don't do this and don't do this, are not asking for a balance, but they're putting the emphasis one way and we're trying to find a little bit more of a balanced approach. So in terms of current times, I'm not sure if I would say it. In terms of historical, there's no question that in Jewish history, this has been one of the, the common themes, that sometimes we, uh, we take matters into our own hands and forget that we are a nation who ultimately is uh, protected by a Kodesh Baruch important point is we rely uh, uh, I'm sure that we're relying on uh, foreign powers to 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 save us rather than yeah so I again I, I agree with you but I don't think we're I don't think we're in a position today of a rather. Okay. I think we're in a position of in addition to it. Next Pasuk Vigam Huchacham Vayavera. Now this phrase Vigam Huchacham he goes ahead and uh, the Datmi Kras says very simply, this is Lashon Lag. The Navi is mocking the Jewish people. What, you think you're so smart? You know, God's pretty smart also. God is pretty smart. And what's going to happen as a result, that if Ra, he's going to bring evil, unfortunately. If you say that you're going to rely on Egypt, then ultimately, as Rashi points out, there's going to be an element of a midah, keneged midah. You're going to find yourself punished. How are you going to find yourself punished? Because Rashi quotes the Pesach in the Tochach on Devarim, ve'shivcha Hashem Mitzrayim ba'oniyot, that you're going to be brought down by boats into Egypt. You're running to Egypt to find their help? Well, guess what? At the end of the day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to make it that you're going to lose and you're going to be taken to Egypt in captivity. So don't try to outsmart God. Don't think that you know it all. Okay, and the Radak says a little bit different. V'gam hu chacham, still, it can be a, a lashon of law. It can be still a sense of a certain amount of mocking that's taking place here. But according to the Radak, the way he explains it, is God knows what you're thinking, Okay, and that's why the evil is coming. In other words, he knows what you're thinking, and he brings this evil on because your thoughts, your approach, your attempts are are wrong in what you're, how you're trying to resolve these problems that you face. Become al beit mereim, and God is going to rise up. I'm sorry, skip the phrase. Ve'et varav lo isir. And what he said, he has not removed. Now, what is what do you mean? What he had said? The redax is simply all of the the prophecies of the of the prophets before who warned about doing these kinds of things. God hasn't removed them. Those dangers are there. You're choosing to ignore what the neviim have told you. And as a result, Hashem is going to rise up against the Beit Mireim. The Radak says Mireim are the Rishaim from within the Jewish people. God is going to rise up. Now, the phrase, Vekam, Al, rise over, that's a very strong phrase. It's a very strong kind of retribution that the Navi is referring to. Val Ezrat, Pole, Aven, is talking, the Radak says, about the Egyptians. In other words, you're making these plans, you're creating these alliances, you're wrong, you will suffer from it, and they also will fall as well. Okay, or as Rashi says, if you look at the Al Ezrat Pole Aven, there's a Vava Chibur. Now it's true, it really doesn't fit 100% with the Tamea Mikra, with the Trup. Okay, it says, Vekama Al Beit Mareim, there's the two dots above it, which is the Zakev Katan, which is like a comma. And then it says, Va'al Ezrat Poleavan, and on the support of those who are doing the evil. Now, the Vav, the way Rash, the way Rashi says, seems to understand it, is he's saying we're Hashem is going to destroy both together, both the Jews 
and the Egyptians will both be punished by the king of Ashur. So it's the comma of the Zakev Katan is a little bit more complicated there, but this is going to result. Says the Navi, Umitzaim Adam, Velo El. You need to understand Egypt, they're just mortal beings. They're not God. In other words, as the Mitsudat David says, wow, how are you feeling so secure if Egypt is supporting you? They don't have that power, okay? You don't, you don't have that opportunity. Now, the interesting question here, here is, Velo El, is it referring to God, in which case we would write it Velo Kel, or is Velo El like the word powerful, like B'nai Elim and this kind of thing? How does, how does Art Scroll translate Mitzrayim Adam Velo El? Huh? Art Scroll, do you have Sancino? Art Scroll, that's Sancino. Hold on, how's Art Scroll do it? The beginning, the beginning of verse, Natural. you know, huh? And not? Lowercase, lowercase God. Yeah. It has uppercase God. Sancino is uppercase God, and the art scroll has lowercase God. And the reason for it is there's a machloket in the Meforshim. Okay, the machloket in the Meforshim says, um, according to the Radak, for example, the Radak says, they, Mitzrayim, is, are just mortal, and they're not kel. They're not God. So if God wants something different, referring back to the previous pasuk, something different is going to happen. On the other hand, other Meforshim say, that they're just, they're not, they don't have the power from the word L in terms of a power in the sense, they don't have that power. They're not God's lowercase g. And the horses that you're seeking, their horses are, not, are just flesh and they're not ruach. The Dat Sofrim says they're not ruach in the sense is they're not malochim. Uh, um, uh, Okay, they're not messengers of God who are going to be able to do it. The Ruach parallels the word El in the previous phrase. Another way of saying it is if you just would imagine for a moment, and the Dat Mikra picks up on this, that they're picking up, what are the, what are the Jews taking from Mitzrayim? They're taking the horses, the chariots, and the, the drivers, the riders of the chariots. Mm -hmm. They're picking up those things. It brings to mind in some ways the Maaseh Merkava. They're, they're not, they're not the chariots of God. They're chariots of people, and they don't have that power. Vahashem Yate Yado. God is going to Yate Yado. What does Yate mean? And God will anyone with stretch out? Everyone have stretch out? Yate? Yet everyone stretch out. Now it's interesting. Lintot is also to just turn. Okay, you can just turn. Now, normally, notet yadcham, you know, it means to stretch out the arm, but lintot is also to turn a little bit, to stretch a little bit, to, to move a little bit aside. Here, Hashem is going to move his hand in some way. Rashi says, everyone is relying on God right now. And what and everything is in God's hands. God's just gonna like move it a little to the side, and all of a sudden you're gonna fall off that reliance. You're not gonna be able to hold on anymore. It's not gonna be able to have the power that you were relying on. Whereas the Mari Kra says that actually, if you think about it, what is this talking about? Vashem Yateyado, that when you imagine a person who is helping someone else. Imagine a person who has difficulty walking and somebody goes ahead and, and gives them an arm to help them move. If the person who's giving the arm, who's helping them move, slips, what happens to the person who's being helped? They fall as well. Vashem yate yado, God will move his hand. The yado in this case is not the yad of God, but the Yad of Mitzrayim that you're relying upon, V'chashal Ozer V'nafal Azur, and the one who is helping will stumble, and the one who is being helped will fall, V'yachnav Kulam Yichlayum, and all of them together, both the helper and the helped, will be destroyed. The image here is one of two possibilities. First of all, we start out and saying, just realize, the Navi says, why are you relying on Mitzrayim? They're not the all-powerful. They're not going to solve everything. 
Okay. The attack both and he talks both about the 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 um the the government, the, the rule of Mitzrayim, and also talks about the power of Mitzrayim, the horses. And then he says, ultimately, it's in God's hands. So either God will stretch out his hand or just turn his hand slightly, whichever way you're going to say it, and everything's going to fall down. Or you can use this mashal of you're relying on God, but if you, if the one who, if Mitzrayim is going to fall, you'll fall as well. So it's not an absolute. This is not something you should be seeking the help out. God is going to make sure that everything is going to, is, is going to, your plan is going to fall down. Yeah. So what, in note at that time, what should they have done? The Navi said, the Navi had warned them earlier, back in Perak Zion, the Navi warned them, don't make these alliances, those alliances, pray to God and God will save you. And we see that actually. You should have just relied on God for his salvation. That we see in the time of Chizkiyahu, clearly, that if they had relied on God exclusively, and God ultimately saves them in a miraculous way. The northern tribes, if this is talking about Hoshea ben Eilif, they had done tshuva. This is, all of this is coming as a punishment from God. Sancheriv is coming as a punishment from God. He is HaKadosh Baruch Hu's tool at this point. And the Navi wants them to make sure of it. Now, with all of that, cursing them out at this point for their, for their approach of what they're doing, he says as follows, and this is, God is going to save Yerushalayim. Ki cho amar Hashem elai. Thus said God to me. Interestingly, the ki cho is, this is exactly, says the Dat Sofrim, what God said to me. Okay, I'm not making anything up, says the Novi. Just as a lion or a young lion, a kfir is a, um, yeah. I don't know the English word for a young lion, not a cub, not a cub, so, uh, a, a, whatever, a young lion, just like the lion and a young lion. How does it translate in the cub? Really? Okay. Okay. Just like the lion and the, I'm going to stick with kfir. Okay. Just like the lion and the kfir will roar over their um over their prey now what happens why is the lion roaring well the simple thing is that right before it's going to uh to attack it roars but here asher yikre alav maloroim mikulam lo yechat when that lion is trying to go after its prey you could have a mass of shepherds trying to scare the lion away, the lion is going to fall upon the sheep or whatever else is the domesticated animal. And everyone can go ahead and be yelling and it's not going to be afraid. Now, Asher Yikare, interestingly, Mitzudat Zion says that this is actually in Yana Sefa, that this is when all of the... Um, all of the uh, shepherds come together and try to scare off the lion, it's not going to be afraid. According, um, according to the Ibn Ezra, which is the same kind of uh, the same kind of approach, it says all of the shepherds that not that they're going to try to scare it away, but they're going to try to fight this lion as well. Now, the Dat Sofrim says very simply. Okay, that ultimately this is a mashal. It's talking about Yerushalayim. Yerushalayim is going to be the lion. Okay, the shepherds trying to scare it away are going to be assured. We need to put this in in context. Mikolam lo yechat umehamunam lo yanen. Not only they won't be afraid, and from their masses, lo yanen, they're not in any way going to have any. Um, it's not going to back off. In any way. Why? So too will God of the hosts. Also will God of the hosts come to do battle for the Mount Zion and for its hills. Just in other words, the Navi is comparing God to this lion. It's not going to back off. So don't be afraid that Ashur is going to be placing siege over Yerushalayim because Yerushalayim will be safe. And here he says, if you look again, Hashem Tzvakot, every time we use a different 
form of a name for God. There's a reason for it, right? We had Kedosh Yisrael, the sacred one of Israel, the sacred one of Israel, the sacred one of Israel versus the uh, the mortal attempts of salvation with horses and things. We have, whenever we're here, Hashem Tzvakot, because God is coming as a military force, in essence. God's army. God is coming against, and he's going to save them. They thought that all of Ashur thought they were so powerful, it's not going to make any difference. Begam, um, sorry. Ketsiporim afot, ken yagen Hashem tzvakot al Yerushalayim. Like flying birds, that's how God will protect Yerushalayim. Now, what's the idea of a flying bird? We just had, if I, if I want to talk about protection, I'm pretty good with lions. What do I need birds in this picture for? Huh? Oh, interesting. Okay. I'm pretty good with birds. The bird concept here, very good. I like that. Okay. The idea of the bird, the Radak says, the birds come quickly. Okay. The birds are quick. Yeah. That it's going to happen. It's just going to fly right in. Okay. Go back to your drones. What? Oh, no. They're going to fly. That you have, you have both the strength and you have the speed. The other piece is also, if you think about it, the way the birds protect its young in the nest, that's how HaKadosh Baruch Hu is going to protect. Ganon vehitzil, protecting them and saving them. Pasoach vehimlit, passing over and allowing them to survive or to escape. Ganon vehitzil, pasoach vehimlit. Now, what are the phrases here? Well, God is going to save them. And when ultimately God's malochim come to destroy the camp of Ashur, Pasoach, he's not going to touch the camp of Israel, which happens to be the city of Yerushalayim, will be saved. Shuvu, lahasher he mikusara. The Navi tells the Jewish people, return to those that he, you have worked deeply to go away from. It's sometimes for a Jew to, to run away from God, it takes more effort than a Jew run to God. Okay, they were really working hard to try to get away from God. Okay. The essence of this whole chapter is so confusing to me. Hashem put the enemies against Israel. Mm -hmm. So Israel has to fight the enemies but they still have to rely on God. It's easier for a man to fight with another man than to deal with Hashem. I'm not sure I accept that. But that's what it seems like. Well, what it's saying, not, not that not, he's not saying that it's easier. Okay, so that they don't want to do what they wanted, what they're supposed to do. I'm not saying that they're taking the easy path. There's a certain amount of hubris in, <laughs> in, in human beings where we forget that there is something more powerful than we are. We like to believe that we're in control of our destinies. We have a hand in our destiny, but we're not in control of the destiny. He's, you got it. And what God is telling the Jewish people is, despite yourselves, I'm going to save your shalom. And this is the principle, by the way, no, this is the same principle we have all the time. Again, Rabbi Willig talked about it uh, last night. Uh, okay, You have this principle that Mashiach is going to come. There are two ways Mashiach is going to come. The easy way and the hard way. Early or when it's going to come, or when he's going to come. And coming down as if it's a miraculous, with a miraculous event, or riding on a donkey because uh, he took the, he, he took jet blue instead of a real airline. Okay? The, all of those people, all of those people, okay? In other words, we have a Kodesh Baruch who ultimately promises us the eternity of the Jewish people. But we can get to that point of eternity easy or hard. And here, the people are choosing the hard way. They're thinking that they're in control of everything. And so here, the Navi is saying, look, you have spent so much time trying to figure out, this, by the way, is Rashi's approach. He says, you have really worked hard to try to find ways of how to going away from God. Okay, That's the way Rashi says it. The entire safer. No. Okay. He says, B'nai, and then the Malbim says, okay, he says, wait a second, if you want to talk about what's going on, think of it as follows. 
God is the most elevated of elevated. Where you're at is the bottom of the bottom. Your evil ways says is not that you have tried really hard to go away from God, but rather you have gone to the bottoms. You've been to the depths versus the greatness of God. And then he adds in the phrase, B'nai Yisrael. The way you read the Pesach is not, Shubu l'asher emiku saru b'nei Yisrael, but, shub, but rather it should be read, Shubu l'asher emiku saru, comma, b'nei Yisrael. You are b'nei Yisrael. It's as if the Dathmi Kraus says, you're greater than that. You're bigger than that. It's like there should be an exclamation mark after the word B'nai Yisrael. And notice how he's referring to the Jewish people. Now he's referring to B'nai Yisrael, that classical term that we talk about the Jewish people, the greatness of the Jewish people who were redeemed at the time of Yitziat Mitzrayim. Remember, there are different ways we talk about Jews. We've been Avram. We have the Mishpah. We have uh, Uvanav, Yaakov Uvanav. Now we have B'nai Yisrael. This, this nation, the Jewish nation, is a nation, the children of Yisrael, who was on top, not Bnei Yaakov, Bnei Yisrael. So God is turning to them and says, you're better than that. Ki yeah. what? Explain. Well, basically speaking, Barry, just coming, just having come back from Israel again for for you know the fifth time, okay, and having visited with Chayalim about to go out to battle with Chayalim who come back from battle, there is an extraordinary renaissance of religion and spirituality among the Chayalim today, okay. The um, and, and not that they're becoming observant, but the fact that they that they understand that there's something bigger than them around them. There are some who are becoming observant, but you know we just—I um, haven't mentioned it in shul yet. Uh, we just part of a process. We just bought fifteen uh, portable RNA kodesh from the shul to uh, to give to tzal. They needed fifty. We did fifteen, or Torah did fifteen, and we're figuring out where the rest are coming from. But the RNA kodesh are being requested. They're being requested even in uh, military bases where no one's going to read from them, where there's not a single observant uh, chayal but they know that there's a symbol to it. The fact the chayalim today are wearing tzitzit, you have chayalim going to battle wearing tzitzit who don't wear kippot. They, they are, the, the tefillot that they're saying before they go out is amazing. So there is, there is that renaissance that's happening and it is something fascinating. And it is one of the uniquenesses of this war, as terrible as this war is. So I'm not willing to say that they didn't read it. Maybe they understood without having read it. I'm going to move on. And the Yomahu on that day. Now, the question is, when is that day? What are we talking about? So there's a machloket, first of all, of how you translate the word key. Okay. First word in, in verse seven. How does Aristotle translate it? Four. Okay. Which is like because. And is there, how does Sensino translate it? Four. Interestingly, the Radak, the Radak says when. Ta'asher. Okay. Radak says, Hashem et Ashur, when God will smite the camp, the encampment of Ashur. The Mitsudat David says, it's a because or a for. Key. On that day, the people will despise their gods of silver, and their gods of gold. The Navi tells them, listen, there's going to come a time and there's going to come a time where people are going to set aside their idolatry. I'm telling you, Jews, get a jump on it. Okay. I'm asking you to do tshuva, the po previous posuk. I'm asking you to do tshuva. Okay. Or as the Mitzudat David says, do tshuva before the miracle has happened. Before everyone else has cast aside their idols, get a jump on it. Those things which you've actually made yourselves, explains the Barbanel, to do sin. Get a jump on it. Do tshuva. Vinafal Ashur Becherev Loish. Ashur is going to fall from the sword that isn't a human sword. 
Now, the Ibn Ezra says that this is a mashal. Okay, he says it's going to be as if the way they're going to fall is if there's going to be the sword of the Becher of Shlufa Biyado, the Malachim are going to come with their drawn swords. It's all parables. Okay, the Shadal says, Rabbi Shmuel David Latzato says, actually, you're right. If I translate Cherev literally as a sword, well, translating Cherev as a sword. Yeah, it has to be a mashal. It has to be, you know, an anthropomorphic expression of how they're going to fall because malachim don't have swords. But Shodal says, no. What's the sword of a uh, of a malach, the sword of Hashem? That's going to be the magifa, the plague. It's the way he strikes them. So he says, this is not a mashal. It should be, Shodal says, the cherub of Hashem is the magifa. It's going to be the plague that is going to destroy the soldiers of Ashur that happens in the time of Chizkiyahu. The nafal Ashur becherev lo ish, becherev lo adam tochlenu, and the cherev lo adam tochlenu, and the sword, which is not a person's, will consume them. Ase says the Datsofrim, you know, a lot of times you have uh, a, a pair, um, um, double language in a poetry, right? Poetry, right? So most of the say, listen, what happens here is we're using two phrases. People are going to fall by the um, by the by the sword that is not a man, and they're going to be consumed by the sword that's not a person. They're just the same word being said twice. Rabinovitz in the Dat Sofrim says, "No, no, no. This is not kfenut. This is not doubling it up, but rather that what's going to happen is they're going to first fall in Yerushalayim, and then their nation is going to start diminishing." They're going to escape because of the sword. It follows up the Shadal. After their defeat in Yerushalayim by God, after they start, you know, they see all of this death, they're going to run. And when they run, they're going to lose their power. They're going to lose their courage. They're going to be the subject of others. They're going to be the subject of others the subject of others who are going to try to defeat Ashur and be successful in the defeat ultimately. And their young ones are going to be Lamas. How does it translate the end of the Pasuk? Lamas you? To what? Shall become tributaries? Art scroll, same thing? Bondsmen, good. Okay. Now, if you remember, if you remember, um, in back going back to Egypt, okay. how did Pharaoh succeed in getting the Jews to work for them? For him, now we know there was a whole process that's posukiyud perik aleph say bishmol tavanit chakmalo, huh? Okay, it's first day, but but why would anyone agree to do it anyways? You'll excuse me, you know. Think back to time. What was it? Uh, uh, Tom Sawyer, right? Okay, uh, that he's painting the fence, right? How much fun I'm having, you know, that whole business. Remember that that scene? Okay. Think back to that for a minute. Okay, Powell did not come to the Jews and say, hey guys, this is a lot of fun. Let's make bricks and I'll make it with you and then I'm gonna trick you. In the ancient world, there were there were different kinds of taxes. One of the taxes was if you wanna live in a person's land, you have to provide labor for the government. It's a labor tax. And it wasn't you pay money, you provide people to do the work. Now, here, Ubachurav Lemasiyem, the young men of Ashur are going to be tributaries, what was the other word? Bondsmen. They're going to be the ones who are going to no longer, are they going to be in charge collecting the taxes? They're going to be the ones who are subject to the labor, labor taxes, and they're going to be working for somebody else who's going to be over them. Yeah, you're right. When the Beit HaMikdash was built, we don't find that same thing. There was, it wasn't, first of all, um, Shlomo actually made everybody from within the Jews. It wasn't the same kind of like of a foreign power imposing a tax and, and, and Hiram also helped out as well with that same process and maybe with his people. But we find it normally that this concept of the mass is some kind of power over an authority that is over, that is oppressing via that kind of tax. So the Bachra of Lamasiu, the last pasuk of this brief parak, okay, Vesal O, Mimagoria Avor. Now, Vesalo, his rock. Oh. 
I found, and I'm sure there are more, I found four different explanations of what this is referring to. His rock uh, is, again, I'll ask you for translations. How does Pasuk uh, Tet start in the translation? Huh? His rock? His rock. Okay, good. According to Rashi, his rock refers to the power of Sancheret. The power of Sancheret. According to the Targum Yonatan, like a rock is a, you know, okay, rock of ages, okay? Just think of that. What Targum Yonatan says, the Shiltanoi, his government. The Abarbanel says, similar to those two, that Sancheret, who is considered the rock of Assyria, the powerful one. Malbim says, no, it is the Ma'ozo Shel Ashur, the Ma'oz um, um, uh, in this kind of case is the place like a shelter, like a place where you, uh, fortress, the fortress of Ashur, the rock. All of them are talking about a sense of power and safety. Variations on that same theme. Vesalo Mimagor Avor. Now, from Magor is Lotag, for instance, from the phrase Lotagur Mipneish, don't be afraid. From terror, Yaavor will pass. Okay, in other words, the one who had been powerful once, who had we been able to, who people relied on, this powerful Assyria, they're going to run away. They're going to be nothing. Vechatu Minesarav. And they'll be devastated. Vechitatu Chavotam, if you remember to break up. Okay, Minez from fleeing. Okay, Sarav, his officers are going to be broken up through their flight. Now, interesting, Minez also has multiple explanations. Minez, for instance, Lanus, to run away. Minez might come from the term of the miracle that his people, his, his officers, are going to be devastated from the miracle that's going to strike them, the destruction around Yerushalayim. And then there's a real interesting explanation that it comes from the word klunsim. A, a klunas is a, a um, is a large beam, something that you would strike some with. Okay, so from that which struck them, they will they will run they will be broken up. Geographically, a rock is a rock like the foundation of the earth. And so I'm I so, so whenever okay so whenever someone says does anyone my answer is I don't know okay I have not come across that because it's the seller his seller who is him it's Sancheru because we know from the rest of it we talk about Sarav his officers who are running away so whose officers are being destroyed and running away well that's obviously Sancheru in this process so we have we see from we see from those pronouns Neum Hashem and all of this is coming from God strange phrase Asher Urlo Bitzion who has a fire in Zion Betanur Lo Birushalayim and an oven in Yerushalayim now, what's the fire in Zion? The Ibn Ezra says, we're talking about the Mizbeach. Okay. The, he says that this is the Mizbeach of Hashem. In other words, all of this is the protection of Yerushalayim. Why is Yerushalayim being protected? Because God has the Beit HaMikdash there. He's going to protect that city from Ashur. The Ibn Kaspi says, no, what's the Ur? Why are we saying, where do you find fire in the Beit HaMikdash? You find it in the menorah. Rashi says, no, we're not talking about the Beit HaMikdash. We're talking about the, the devastating force of fire. God is the fire. And God is that fire. And the oven of Yerushalayim means he's going to destroy them in your, uh, because of this power or the, uh, the power of Yerushalayim. Now, in, just to finish off the, the parak, just to understand where this parak starts and where it ends, and I know it's very brief, but ultimately it starts once again bemoaning the fact that the Jews felt that they didn't that they needed to seek the support of others without first seeking God step one and then the Navi says despite yourselves despite your actions HaKadosh Baruch who's going to save you 
and he's going to destroy Ashur, Yerushalayim will be saved, whether it, whether it's at the time, this is talking initially, you know, initial the, the discussion is Hashem ben Eil Chizkiyahu, but this latter part is definitely at the time when the Assyrian armies surround Yerushalayim, which will come into, in Perak Lam and Zion, we're going to read about that, and we read about that in Malachim Bet as well, and he's going to save Yerushalayim, and he's going to save Yerushalayim, because this is the place which has, where God is at, and you should do tshuva. In other words, it's going to be saved whether you do tshuva or not. Do tshuva, it'll come out to your benefit because you'll get ahead of, you'll get ahead of the, the game on that way. You'll come back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu before everyone is going to recognize HaKadosh Baruch Hu's power. We're going to stop right here. Next week, we're going to continue with the same parrot, with the next parrot. So, if we don't do multiple trips, we're going to have multiple days. I can read